Hey yo, this is Mega Rand. And if you don't want a reek of averageness, you should listen to Cabbages. That's right, I stretch the rhyme. I do that all the time. It's me, peace. Hi, Gary. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Uh, Gary, we we promised a while back that we were going to have more fun mm. on the podcast. Stop watching terrible films. Yeah. Uh, and this is a really excellent example of like the, the kind of film that we watch on this show. Mm-hmm. It's just very cabbages, this film. It yes. made me wonder, in the good, bad movie universe that we aren't in, we don't have mm-hmm. to argue or anything. In the good bad movie universe, is this a good bad movie or a bad bad movie? For those who have paid attention to the uh, name of this episode, we are talking about the Meteor Man. That's right. 1993's Robert Townsend vehicle. Mm-hmm. I would argue that this is a good bad movie. You if would we argue were doing good, this bad. as if we were doing this in bad movie battle season, yeah, yeah, I would contend that this is a good bad movie. I, I'd be curious it's to hear if you think movie. differently though. I'm undecided. I'm going to let the the conversation sway me as Mm -hmm. we go. But there are a number of excellent points as to why it is not a good movie. Mm -hmm. That it is a bad movie. And with Mm -hmm. any bad movie, there's always an excuse for you to believe it's bad, bad. You know what I mean? Okay. We watched it twice and I'm still not sure about it. That's a bad sign. Okay. So See, I, I would counter that this is a good, bad movie because... It was rewatchable. Think of all the bad, bad movies we watched that were agony to do a second time around. Gang related. This I was season. a little bored with this on the second one, but I wasn't mad. Mm-hmm. The, oh, this is you. I think I ranted on the episode about gang related about how I yes. fucking hated that movie. Yeah, <laughs> I was so mad the second time around. I was like, please let me stop, please. It was, and it it was, was agony well to watch it a second hours. time. Yeah, agony to watch the one a second. Absolutely, time. this was not that. That's true. That's a good no. argument. Like, it's a good argument. I think I know where I'm going to so fall, great. but I'm going to I'm going to let we're going to talk to Mega Ram. I can't believe we got Mega Ram on this one, dude. I'm so holy excited. shit. We got fucking Mega Ram talk. Like to talk about Meteor Man. Like honestly, like it. it and just, I just like, like I know he's going to come in and just be like, "Well, here, bop, bop, bop," and we're going to be like, "Word, that was fun." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's where I'm going to land. I am truly thrilled to introduce our guest for today's show. Joining us now is the one, the only, Mega Rad. Yo! Known for his his love of video games, wrestling, and basketball, among other delightful subjects. This hip-hop veteran has been dropping rap albums for nearly two decades now. And his latest album, uh, 2523's Family Friendly Buddies Magic Toy Box, he's got a new project as well with fellow rapper Germicide, so please look out for that as well. Hello and welcome to the show. Man, thanks for having me. That's a great intro. You got right to all the good stuff. No, you got, you got right to focus. You, you got to focus, Thank man. You. Like with a career like yours, it's like it's so much to go through. And like there's so much we can talk about. Obviously, we have this this movie that I'm I'm excited to have you on for. But I heard that you just got back from the uh Kevin Smith Cruise Askew. I did. It was such an awesome time, man. I uh, I didn't know what to expect. Going on a cruise is always fun, of course, but Man, it was it was an absolute blast. I had so much fun. So you did performances. I imagine you got to hang out with folks as well. Yeah, it was a little too fast to really get to hang out, though. It was a whole weekend where you're just kind of moving. I had two concerts, uh, a podcast with Mark Bernard, and, and the rest of it was just running around, drinking, hanging out, trying to see friends. Uh, yeah, it was just a whirlwind, but it was so much fun, though. I could have used another day or two of just like doing nothing on the beach. A little relaxation, right? I think you could probably, at the end of all of this, you could probably scrawl that on everyone's tombstone. <laughs> I could have used one or two more days. Just put that on my my head, my one head. One or two more days. <laughs> one or two more days. That, nothing crazy. Just one or two more days. I could have yeah. used it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, for those who don't know, uh, Mega Ran's song "Tractor Beam" off of the incredible Live '95, truly one of my favorite projects of yours, is in Clerks Three. So yes. there's an even more cinematic reason to have you on here. However, we're not talking about Clerks 3 today. We are talking about 
The Meteor Man, one of the yeah. hardest movies to watch so far this season in terms of getting our hands on it. It was really yeah, hard. This- this wasn't easy. Um, you know, I appreciate you guys, you know, full disclosure, mailing me a copy, you mm-hmm. know, to get this done. I would have totally went and just bought it or found it through other means. But I appreciate y'all copping a, a Blu-ray for your Yeah. Thank no, you. we're made happy. Blu-ray, Honestly. First Blu-ray I've watched on my PS5, if I can be honest. All mm-hmm. right. That's, that feels momentous. And obviously, you know, the first Blu-ray being a movie from 1993 is very exciting. <laughs> That's the choice. It's fitting. It's Not so a lot fitting. of bonus features on that Blu-ray. I have one as well. It's really just movie. Do we know why it's not available? Uh, I don't exactly know. Is this like a streaming is. fight or? A lot of this stuff is that like, I mean, not to bring up Kevin Smith again, but there's this whole protracted thing with Kevin Smith and Miramax about dogma mm-hmm. and the rights to that. So you can't basically, you can't, I think you might be able to rent it certain places, but you can't stream it. And it, it, it's a lot of that's, of that's That might be a win for a lot of folks. I don't know. I'm a big fan. <laughs> but like behind this, but behind the scenes is a lot of these yeah. things. But like it's interesting because like so much of like what Robert Townsend, the director and writer and star of this movie, mm-hmm. does is available on these platforms. I rewatched Hollywood Shuffle not too long ago mm-hmm. on I might have even been on Tubi, you know, my Excellent. favorite streaming service, period. And uh, you know, Five Heartbeats <laughs> is available too. You can get these things. Carmen Hip Hop is available. So this was sort of like based on who you are and what you represent, I thought this would be a great conversation to have. But I just wanted to start by asking, like, had you seen The Meteor Man before? No, I had not. And it's one of those movies that I remember when it came out. I totally remember where I was. And it just totally, I don't know how I missed it. You know, when you look at this lineup, I mean, we're going to get to it, but the cast is incredible. Like, there's just so many people that I know and love. It's a who's who of the future. It really is. And yeah, the past. But, and the past. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the past, it's the present, and the future. Like, it's just, it's a testament to Robert Townsend's brilliance to get all these people together. Like, I know this person's funny, and I know they're going to be great, so let's go. And, um, yeah, like, it's it's really a who's who of, of what's what. And, you know, it's so 90s that I'm just a little disappointed in myself that I hadn't watched it. Like, it, it gave me a lot of good feelings, man. Like, okay, so 1993, I'm like, all right, I'm in high school at this point. Mm-hmm. And maybe mm-hmm. my focus is less about movies and more about girls. That's probably where my head is at. I was like spending all my money on music and I was very as a girl, less of the going to a movies on a Friday or Saturday night. And if I did go to the movies, I might not have been paying attention all that much to it. So no. I was lucky enough to go on a date. I saw this. When I, when I got like halfway through, mm. <clears throat> I realized I knew what was going to happen. Okay. But I truly don't remember seeing it. I know I've seen it, but I don't remember how, when, but it did happen at some point. Was it a video store thing, you think, maybe? More than likely. I think I've revealed on here before that I sort of ancillary worked at a video store. I worked at the newsstand part. And they showed a lot of movies. This was... You know, it was family friendly enough to where it wasn't sure. going to cause problems playing it during the day. I'm sure that somebody put this on at some point. And intentionally family friendly. The idea was that mm-hmm. this was meant to be a family movie. You know, Robert Townsend, who has commented on this, you know, in retrospect, and we can talk about that a little later, you know, sort of said like his intentions was to create a, you know, a superhero movie that the family could all go see and that had a black superhero front and center. And he wanted to be that superhero. So not only did he want to make this movie, he wanted to be the star of this movie. He -hmm. wanted to be the superhero and he got to be it. So, I mean, regardless of the reception it received and box office situation, which was not pretty, he got to do what he wanted to do, which was to be essentially, you know, if other than, you know, he got to have the claim of first, you know, black superhero movie star. Mm -hmm. And like there are some, you know, there's an asterisk at the end of that. There was definitely some exploitation films of the 70s and films like that where yeah. there were actors and characters with superhero heroic uh, powers and things like that. That definitely played into the genre. But for like a big Hollywood studio movie, you know, this was mm-hmm. even with a relatively low budget compared to some, say, Batman 1989 or Batman Returns in 92. It's still a, a, a big deal. This is a big deal feature with a nationwide release. So you kind of got to give them that credit there for doing something like this so early for sure. on. Absolutely. You mentioned the cast, and I think the cast may be a great starting point because the first time I watched this, which was just this week, I watched it twice this week, but the first viewing, 
most of the time it was just me and Jeff and I, we watched these things remotely, but basically text each other throughout. And it was just like, we were just basically all caps, people's names. Whenever, constantly. whenever, especially if we've seen people in other movies we've covered, because mm-hmm. we've been doing this for, you know, what, five, six seasons now, something like that. It's, it's a long time. And we see some people recur and anytime we do, it's all caps. And it was like all caps for two hours. Everyone is in Everyone. this movie. Yeah, it's just it's it's insane. <laughs> it's also amazing who I missed on the first round. Yeah. Like I you caught I got so excited seeing people that the like, credits. I, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Faison Love is in this movie, and he is. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's got several lines. Yeah. How about the uncredited Chris Tucker? As just voice only. In just the mall. voice only, and I immediately picked it up when I heard it. I was like, "Oh wow, hey, that's Chris Tucker!" And then I looked <laughs> like I don't see him mentioned anywhere in this, so maybe it's not. And yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I good, don't know if there were catch. any. I don't know if there were any scenes with him that were filmed where he was actually present in that, but he's the audio remains, so it definitely it's a, it's a, it's an uncredited role, but it's a really good catch. But like when John Witherspoon shows up, you know, mm-hmm. we're huge John Witherspoon fans mm-hmm. on this show and even before this show. So oh, yeah. every time he shows up in a movie, we get excited. He makes everything he does, everything he did was better because he was in it. Yes, even some of the worst movies I've seen, I'm just like John Witherspoon's in it. I'm going to enjoy at least that part. At least that's going to be amazing. <laughs> And then it's like Robert Guillaume, mm. Marla Gibbs, and maybe the wildest James Earl Jones role in we gotta any talk film about it of all time. We have to. We have to talk did, about did it. Did you? Okay. So, like, I want to because I know Jeff's impression because we started. We were talking about this pretty extensively. But what did you think when you saw? Where you at on JJ? We need. We need with, to know. Is that his name, JJ? J-E-J. 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 Oh, James Earl Jones. James Earl Him Jones. being, man, I am a huge James Earl Jones stan for life. And I never thought I'd see him in this light. Uh, only Robert Townsend could do this. Where he was, I mean, I could imagine that conversation being like, hey, uh, <laughs> so you're going to wear like crazy haircuts and like just kind of be a little wild in this, bro. And, you know, kick back a little bit. You're so serious. Like, just kick back. And um, I was shocked. He was probably my favorite part of the movie. Like I have him written down in my notes like four different times where I'm like, look at his <laughs> hair now. Look at the 76ers shirt. Look at him Dude, wrapping outside before he runs off. The the box, but the box with a wave hanging off the top of <laughs> yes, it. Yes, yes. Look, I'm I'm not here to, it, it just, it, what? Man. The wigs is- were wild. In this amazing one. that amazing. was a wild choice of wigs and beyond the wigs which obviously just like you're just blown away like the way he's talking and it's like has he ever played a nerd in a movie ever this distinguished actor like he'd won like like a national arts medal the year before like honored by it like honored in washington dc for his contributions the man had like won tony awards he was a legend at this stage and it's like i'm gonna go and be a nerd who really likes old jazz records and kind of can't talk to girls. You know, what's weird is that don't you feel like it was correct? The character it was mm. disturbing. You know what I mean? Like it, it was the, pretty, <laughs> pretty dead on a person who says there, I will never give up. Like I wouldn't give up my records for anything is yes. going to obsess over wigs and try. I think the whole thing was that he was trying to be younger than he was. Yes. That he was trying to hold on to some sort of like gimmicky youth. And, but but it couldn't have, I mean, like he was old enough in this where it wasn't like a midlife crisis. No, he was an old man. He even refers to yeah, himself yeah. as an old man in the film. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't know, man. It was a really crazy character. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do with it. I truly had no idea what to do with it. Okay. I didn't realize that he does refer to himself as an old man. I thought he was just... You know, like this was a weird inside joke. Like he's a young guy, but he just looks really old. You know, I would have. That's loved what that. I thought that too. Been, but then he what? says, "Yeah." Then he says, "Well, I'm an old man." You're like, yeah, "Are you?" Yeah. There's a scene. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> there's a scene at the community center 
when uh, they're trying to convince him to wear the orange, you know, community watch hats. And he's like, I'm not wearing that. He says, I know what the headline's going to be. And he says something along the lines, he goes, old man in orange hat found with whistle, dead with whistle shoved up his ass. <laughs> like, up his butt. Sorry, his up best his line, butt. Yeah, his Because it's a family film. movie. It's a family, it's film. A family movie. Family film. Butt. We'll cover whether, whether or not it's a family film momentarily. But it, well, let's, let's... They believed uh, it was a family film. No, what yeah. Was the, what was the rating? Was it, was it PG? It was PG. It, it was, was PG. originally P, it was originally okay. PG thirteen. They took a couple things out to get it down to PG. So, right. but it didn't take that much. Like the UK version is similar. They took a couple of the, like a couple of really. It's really just some of the action stuff. They took a couple of things out that just got it down to okay. We can we can families can watch this. But okay. it wasn't the, like dramatic. Yeah, you know. the shootings are kind of. I mean, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to go. immediately bring it up, but no, like, you, you would think it. maybe a lot of guns here. Maybe you might want to like tone back the gun violence in the kids' film, but no, no, they went with it. They went with the gun violence. It was it's one it thing was to lot. have guns. It's one thing to have guns, but to shoot mm -hmm. them at people, like to try to murder them. To be oh, fair, no one dies of the gun violence, right? Am I? wrong that is the that's the key difference except yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's really the key difference because they're superpowers so you you can't yeah like mm -hmm. there are people who are shot at but no one is ever murdered with a gun and i think that's right. probably what keeps it from the pg the pg-13 role like even the the woman who is assaulted in her home who we only kind of see in the aftermath early on in the film yeah. it just she was beating her home and you know nothing is on screen you're just hearing it like, they also oh, don't discuss it it's no, just exactly. sort of you walk up to the scene and you have to assume yeah. that a gang member has either robbed or just for no reason beaten this person but given some of like the really violent action films that we've watched for this show or otherwise the number of guns in this movie is well beyond what you expect in a pg film yes. the end of this movie which we we're not gonna we're not Ooh. gonna quite pierce that veil yet i think we should talk mm. about other things first but i don't know the guns is a big part the of the gun game. the gun there are at least a hundred guns at the end of this thing. At least <laughs> might be the most, guns. The most guns ever in a PG film. I, I it's feel gotta like. be the record. What for what would the real? record be? It's a lot of guns. A note for what Gary, one that I meant to give you, uh, is mm. that you know, we just saw this movie gang related that had zero yes. gangs in it. Yes. And then in this superhero movie for kids, there's like four gangs. Yeah. <laughs> there's four different gangs. There's also cast overlap between those two movies. Mm -hmm. You know, gang related is Tupac's final released film, his final posthumous mm -hmm. film. And then it's like James Earl Jones is in that movie. This is four years later. James Earl Jones is in that movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also the woman who plays Vanessa, uh, Leela Roche, like she is in that movie as well, prominently in gang related. So it's like, oh my God, like. There is this like overlap, but again, it speaks a lot of the casting, like who who that um, Robert Townsend could pull. But it's also like, could anybody other than Robert Townsend have gotten away with a finale of a movie where like Bloods and Crips are on top of rooftops with weaponry pointed at people on the ground, Arsenals. also with weaponry? Yeah, and it just ends in a back and away. Frank Gorshin, the Riddler, has to go on vacation now. Yeah, are, are we talking about the ending? Is that what we're talking about? No, but actually, I really okay. just want to talk okay. about okay. Frank. Can I talk about? I want to talk about Frank Gorshin. That's I what know I want to talk you about. do. I know oh you do. God. Yeah, because Townsend was like, as if you read interviews with Townsend, Townsend was a big fan of like the Superman and Batman TV shows of his yeah. youth. He watched mm -hmm. those shows. He loved those programs. And Frank Gorshin played the Riddler in those Adam West, Burt Ward, uh, you know, Batman's. So choosing him as the big bad is like totally like geeky excited i get to bring yeah. this guy in i get to get like the big bad one of the best villains i've ever seen in my youth that gets to be in this that's incredible that's so exciting to me and like so like you see him on screen like awesome beyond james Earl jones like who were you most happy to see in this film i gotta say john witherspoon a uh, tiny lister Ooh, um, yeah young you tiny know, young tiny with the blonde hair i was like well i don't think i ever remember him with hair so, they set the precedent for being a big tough guy that got the crap kicked out of him. Yes. It happens in a few movies. <laughs> it does. He really he got <laughs> paid in the 90s to be huge and get the crap kicked out. He got of him. beat up. Yeah. He just keeps getting beat up. Yeah. Uh, uh Biz Markey was a nice little, there little is. pop up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was really happy about that. Um, you know, I just listened to an interview with who was it? O'Shea Jackson Jr. He did an interview and uh he's a big wrestling fan, so he's on a wrestling podcast. And um, and they were just talking about his journey, and he was saying um that 
he tries to play a role that's completely different from his previous role every time. He's like, I, I will not play the same role two times in a row. And I'll probably never play a rapper again. And they're like, what? What's this? You know, you played your dad, you know. And uh, and he was like, man, rappers get typecast, okay? And Superman is never going to be a rapper, is what he said. Or Spider-Man is never going to be a rapper. He's like, I don't think they take rappers seriously enough in Hollywood to ever give them a giant role if you come in as a musician. Because he's like, he used to write raps. He used to perform. And he completely stopped to do Hollywood because he learned through his journey that they would never make a rapper step out of that line and become something big. I don't know. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And then in here, you know, every rapper is a gang. You member. will get an action hero here and there. Yeah. Mostly on the thieving side, but yeah. still, still like, Does like, Will Smith you know, count? a DMX I mean, probably, or Will Smith. Doesn't will count. Smith. But it took, how long did it take before he was a hero? Yeah, no, Will Smith was the out he's the outlier yeah. in this situation. Yeah, you gotta think about you gotta think about Ice Cube. You gotta think about Ice T, like the mm -hmm. guys who were the pioneers of sort of the rapper appearing on screen. You know, mm -hmm. like in this movie, there's a lot of rappers. And again, part of why we chose this movie is like this is basically our second half of our rapper movie season where we're sort of exploring these movies where rappers are in front of the camera, behind the camera. And there were just so many different people in this that was like this is had to be covered, you know. Yeah. But it's like big big daddy Kane's in this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he's also in gang related as well. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, that's right. He's in gang related too. But but Big Daddy Kane like has like one line in the entire film. He's mostly just staring everybody down. Yeah. But like the same the same sort of like menace, although on a totally different level, is applied to maybe my favorite cameo in the entire film. Luther Vandross. Luther Vandross. Luther Vandross. I Luther. knew it. That's who I I loved that Luther oh. Vandross was in this movie. Yes. And didn't say a single I was like, word. Wait, did he? he didn't get a line, right? No. <laughs> he didn't get he a single mugged. line. He was in it a lot, though. He was. <laughs> he had so like 15 he... minutes of screen time and just kind of walked into each scene being like. The best one of these scenes <laughs> with him. The best one of these scenes is when they're in Robert Townsend. We haven't talked about the Meteor Man. <laughs> Jefferson Reed's apartment building. And the woman is like running down the stairs to get away from the bad guys. And then there's luther vandross with a gun with a silencer on it he's just like waves her away with the gun like yeah i'm here yeah. to kill somebody no big deal that's it that's, that's like it. that's it like that's brilliant just brilliant <laughs> and i think that that that's, that says a lot about robert townsend as a writer as a director and his comic sensibility is his ability to say like i'm going to take somebody who you recognize right who you know who these people are you mm -hmm. recognize people and i'm going to give them to you either as you expect them or in some hilarious way. Mm. I'm just going to do that because I can. He can get James Earl Jones to play that role. He can get Luther Vandross to basically be mute in the entire film and still get legitimate laughs. And then he can get somebody like Wallace Shawn to come in. and be Wallace like Shawn. A complaining teacher. Two minutes of Wallace Shawn. Practically it, he made a wild impression on the film, but he was in there for about, I think, probably two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> if even that. One even of the bigger that. stars... In the whole movie, and they were like, "All right, man, we just need you to come in, kind of moan and complain about stuff. Then someone's going to start making some points and make you look dumb, and then they're just going to wander off. <laughs> they're not going to finish those thoughts. They're just going to wander off." And he was like, "Cool, sign me up. I love Robert Townsend. <laughs> Sounds great." <laughs> I think a lot of this is a testament to Robert Townsend. Like, oh yeah, how many people could be like, "Hey, yes, yeah, I just want you to come in, just do a couple things, and look silly." Yeah, like all right, all. I'm trusting the process. Yeah, Let's go. that's how you can get like some legitimately like people who were hot at the time. Like Sinbad is in this movie, mm -hmm. and his character is wild. Okay, Malik, it's time to talk about Sinbad. <clears throat> is Sinbad white in this film? I'll give you. I'm going to give you what I have. But all I have is okay. this, a couple of lines that I pulled out. So yeah. this is the first time that Sinbad's character is dating a black woman. Right. right. He's very excited about the whole thing. And he says he feels black. Yes. In the situation. He he says, my real name's Bernard. Right. He's coming, he's presented as Malik, but he says, reveals to Robert Townsend for no reason. That I no my real name is Bernard. And then oversharing immediately. His like, you know, there's a lot of movies. That sounds uh, like white people though. There's a lot of movies. <laughs> sounds like us. But there's a lot of movies that we've seen that we've stayed over the years. We're like, 
there is a black character playing kind of white suburban, you know, like mm-hmm. I, I, we saw that I saw this in, you see, there's a number of number of movies. I watched Mo Money again recently, and that happens in that scene as well. There's somebody yeah. who sort of like plays like a kind of conservative sort of type, and sometimes they're played for jokes and otherwise. So I thought maybe that was what this was, but it's also his like butchering of slang is really mm-hmm. extraordinary. There's a line at the mall when Sinbad runs into Robert Townsend where he says, "Stay chilly, peace him out." That is which, what he says. Which. I'm going to start saying on the show. Yes. I have to. It's a good ending. All right. Stay chilly, man. Peace him out. Peace him out. (laughs) Stay chilly. Well, again, he was on his way. He's on his way to go get dreadlocks. I got to burn one for Sinbad. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's a wild (laughs) character. This movie is this movie so black that they hired a black man to play a white man. That's (laughs) fucking sick. Well put. (laughs) I love it. Well put. Well, right. they had to make the, a white guy the big bad, though. I feel like that's yes. oh, classic, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, felt black exploitation, you know, style where it's like, first I was like, oh man. And they, they mentioned a couple of times, they say black on black crime, black on black violence. And they mentioned it a few times. And I'm like, is it really going to be just black on black violence? Wait a minute. And then we show the true, you know, the true bad guy. <laughs> yeah. And that's not, and it's like, it's a global bad guy. Like, you know, the, yeah. the Golden Lords perhaps the most coordinated multi-generational gang of all time. Totally amazing. The um, hair, the outfit. They spent, they spent the, a lot of money on the look. As baby a gang, Lords, and not as baby like Lords. the movie, but the gang itself, a lot of their overhead is going into the look of the baby lords. Have you ever tried to dye a baby's hair? Mm. It's hard. Not, not recently. Mm. It's hard. It's not easy. I bet it's really hard. Have you? Has anybody here? I have not. Not lately. Yeah, I know. No. Not lately. But it's like they're all part. But even like the top of the Golden Lords is still just part of a larger criminal organization that is international. Yet somehow run by Frank Gorshin. Um, but international, like they show a room. That's where Luther Vandross. There's clearly somebody who's meant to be Middle Eastern. There's somebody is like some Europeans, like there's just like they gloss over this in this one scene. And it it sort of like leaves alone at that point until later on in the film when the big bad, once he's got his meteor powers and he has seemingly defeated our hero, mm-hmm. says, I want to call together all the world leaders. I'm like, wait, are he talking about the, like the bad guys in his organization? Or is he like wants to speak to all the presidents and prime ministers around the world? <laughs> like he I just went his... from local to global in yeah. like five minutes. I think That's his, yeah. well, so here's something I actually really like about the film mm. at the beginning of, so the meteor has now sucked its way into the body of our hero. It's weird how it happens, right? Like he gets hit with a meteor, which should kill you on impact. Mm -hmm. But instead, this thing just sort of envelops into him. There's two things I really, I don't really understand the powers all that well. But what I like is that he doesn't immediately know he has powers. No. He's sort of walking around doing the thing. He feels a little off. He notices some things in the hospital as it sort of flares up. It's an onset. It, it takes him a while to get to the point where he like can stop a car or fly or any of that stuff. He doesn't really understand what he can do. And this dude who's been battling them the whole time sees all that stuff and is like, if I can do that, I'm taking over the world. And I think he means world leaders like stack them up. U.S. Prez, mm-hmm. prime ministers, kings. I'm gonna just, take him off. Bypass my boss. Let's go to the the world. Because he boss. doesn't yet understand <laughs> that the powers wear off over time. Right. Mm-hmm. And then later, our hero touches the thing again and gets like zooted up. But because it's not enveloped in him, it wears off in like an hour instead of a few days. Yeah. That was pretty cool. I like that. That they paid attention to that because there's a lot in this movie. They don't pay attention to, and that's okay. Like it's a family movie. I'm not gonna like sit down and criticize all these things. But oh, that not, was one where I would. No? Eh, I can if no, you really I, want me to. Could. I'd rather you not. Actually, I'd rather you just accept <laughs> this for what it is. That's what I'm trying to do, Gary. Right. You said 
You said in our production meetings that I'm too critical of these terrible films. Now, family, this, yeah, family movies. Family. My one of my main issues is um he starts off as a musician and then like the love for music just disappears. Never again. Like <laughs> no one, no one ever mentions music again. Yo, I was like, wait, isn't he in a band? Like what? <laughs> like his stuff got stolen and the dream was gone. Like I swear it was 10 minutes into the movie. Like they just never mentioned it again. I'm like, a lot happens in the first 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm like, which is like the once? hallmark like, of having too much on your plate is like the first 10 to 15 minutes. We needed everything. Everything. I was everything. like, oh, maybe we'll end with a concert. Like that's what I can right. think. Like, ah, we what got a big I was together. thinking, what I was thinking might happen is that one of his many powers might have been like especially enhanced prowess on the upright bass. And mm. suddenly he is this virtuosic musician. Like they keep calling him in the first like, few minutes, he keeps getting referred to as Winton Marsalis, sort of in the like mm. braggadocious way. Like suddenly he should be playing incredibly like i thought there might be a moment where that happens and you would maybe... think a jazz nerd because that's what we have in uh in our friend jej yeah you would think a jazz nerd would pick a drummer or i'm sorry a, a bassist mm -hmm. like he would know someone who played the bass well yeah. enough to be like i'm going to compare you to the right instrument but you know we're nitpicking no, now that's nitpicking <laughs> we're but nitpicking. point but point entirely well taken is in my notes as well that the jazz subplot immediately goes away. Gone. Also, <laughs> his bass and he was like, "Well, that's it." <laughs> you know what on. else vanishes? This is, what the, else? this is the setback that killed it. <laughs> you know what else vanishes? His like day to day job as a substitute teacher. He's just gone. He's gone. just no longer that, but he still shows up at the school <laughs> for one scene inexplicably. He hasn't <laughs> teach. He's not teaching kids anymore. We don't no, know how long gone. he was in hospital. But all we know is that something he shows up at school once he, but like, we don't see the principal again. We don't it see was long Nan enough for someone Nancy, to come to his Nancy house. Nancy Wilson as principal. That's insane as well, too. Like It was again, long enough for, for Eddie Griffin to come back to the house, which, by the way, was one of the, maybe the best Eddie Griffin performance in a movie ever. No. Anyway. Well, I don't know about that. I think he was good. He that was little good. prayer he says over the, over mm -hmm. the bedside. Yeah. I was like, name another movie where he came in with the hard, it's just me and God moment. Undercover Brother? It didn't happen in Undercover Brother. It did. Undercover I'm brother. telling you, it didn't happen. Okay. I've seen it too many times. All right. Okay. <laughs> it's been a minute since I watched it. I'll take your word it's, for it. It's really wonderful, the film, but it's not that kind of wonderful at all. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Robert Towns is in that too, by the way. Awesome. You know, just... I, I, my my biggest thing, since we're since we're bringing up the gripes, Okay. Is that it seems like a bunch of people know that he's the superhero. He's not wearing a mask. No. None of like it shouldn't be hard for people to understand who it is. And yet there just seems to be a bunch of people that don't know who he is. They don't know what he looks like. He hasn't been identified to them, but they're excited enough to go see him <laughs> sight unseen when mm. Eddie Griffin pretends to be Meteor Man. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But maybe he's just too fast that he never was caught, you know, on camera or film or whatever. I it's guess so. Yeah. They know who but he is like, on the block. They know who he is on the block. The neighborhood like, is this is like Washington, nobody DC. nobody from the neighborhood is gonna talk to the, the press about this. I guess no, no snitching. No, 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 no snitching. Oh, fuck out of here. That's movie yeah. magic then. Someone in the community is gonna tell somebody something. Family if know friendly a, movie. If you know a superhero, I know. Well, never mind, Gary. You don't talk to anybody. But if I knew a superhero, at least a couple of people would hear about it. I've got mm -hmm. a lot of friends. Well, and a couple of people everybody. that it would really interest. But a lot. Yeah, of mom words. told everybody, but just not. She didn't tell anybody outside of the block. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> she kept. Yeah. It. So it's, we're it's we're trusting block. the block on this. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's fair. It was confusing to me who did or didn't know and why. Oh. Well, mm. This film is cut and edited in such a way that is very confusing about mm, kind of, there fair. are clearly subplots and through lines that are chopped up and discarded. Love interests are not really dealt with properly. Like these sort of things go by the wayside. But like if you just Ebert, sit and, I, back, Ebert and I actually see eye to eye on this. I read his review and he's shocker. basically like, I know. He <laughs> was like, uh, this this is actually a really fun movie that wants to be good but there's too much 
they wanted to fit everything that ever happens in a superhero movie ever into this thing. And it went too long and still didn't have enough time. And that's so it's a victim of its own animation, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Which Obviously. I'm like, that's great. You know what I mean? Like, that's so much better than the normal crap we watch. <laughs> yeah. But but tell me though, in the catalog of rapper movies as we've been watching them or as that we're all familiar with, like tell me that there isn't a song quite like, and you know what I'm gonna say, Big Hat Ray Ray's Ain't Nobody Bad Like the Meteor Man. Tell me, and as the resident rapper on this call, I do have to ask you, sir, what is your impression of the original song for this movie? Man, I'm a sucker for New Jack Swing, first of all. Yes. So mm -hmm. once I hear that, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. And it's the 90s. It's like, you got to do it. And, you know, as we learned in uh, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, every superhero needs a theme song. So I was all for it. Um, I mean, as far as superhero songs go, it's a little corny, but it's it's not it, it does the job. It it's a shame though that usually when it's movies like this, like the song or the soundtrack kind of becomes the star. You know, the movie doesn't get talked about, but then a song or two from it from that soundtrack winds up kind of popping off. And I don't think that happened with this movie. Like I don't remember any song from this soundtrack, and maybe that's why I wound up not seeing it. It's like a song would have kind of drove me there. So they, with all these great musicians, like they didn't, they didn't knock out the hit, you know? And I think, I mean, why not another bad creation or somebody that sure. was currently working and like, ah, like, why didn't yeah. they do the Meteor Man theme song? There's, there's so many things about this movie that date the movie to when it is. Number one, they put like the date on the screen at some point. Now. Uh, yeah, they put now. Now. <laughs> Watching now. DC. Now. Now. But nothing dates a movie quite like having a song about the movie in the trailer, like or in the in yeah. the closing credits. Men in Black. Because it doesn't happen that much anymore, if at all. Are you really even going to get in a non-Bond film a, a song about the movie? No, it doesn't happen it's much. Phenomenal. But one of the greatest of all time is Bobby Brown on our own. Ghostbusters mm. 2, I'm going to stand on this forever. Ooh, and that song's amazing. And he recaps the whole movie in the rap. He just I stand it. with you. One of the most impressive versions. That and the series of songs in the original Chevy Chase, Fletch. Mm. They wrote a song called Fletch, Get Out of Town, while literally he was driving a car fast to get out of town. <laughs> That's cool. Does what it that says is, on the that's nasty. Well, that's like we really. That's thought. You put some thought, some thought into there. That's a, all uh, right. That's uh. That, that's that genre has now become nerdcore. That's what. Yes, that's what, that's what it is. Right. It's exactly right. It's you like, have yeah. soundtracked so many things that didn't have a soundtrack. You provided the narrative soundtrack to these things. About fantasy, can, whatever it is. If you can make it a slapper, like that's the, mm -hmm. the double the double bonus. So to me, Bobby Brown With on our it. own is always my goal. Yeah, it's like, can you make it slap? Like, you can tell some story, you can give them some some exposition, but it's got to be a banger. The other thing that does it is a freeze frame at the end of a film. Somebody in the <laughs> middle of something. That doesn't happen anymore either. <laughs> and I'm always on a holy grail search for a movie that does both. I have to ask you about something that uh, Jeff raised in conversation uh -oh. about this. And because you are... Bear in mind, I was really oh, high when I saw this. Okay, you were originally Twice. from you were originally from Philadelphia. Yes, mm. born and raised. Here we go. Born and raised. And I have to assume that you noticed all the 76ers gear in this film. I sure did. In this, what the, the fuck? Jeff, what the fuck? It was wild to me. Nobody uh, wore anything about. Have you ever been to DC? Have you ever been to DC in that time period? Yeah. People loved being from DC. I saw some bullets gear once in a while, but man, there was a moment. Did where you? Like, I missed it then. I saw a bullets hat on Eddie Griffin, like with the the cursive starter yeah. letters. Um, okay, good, because that uh, really bothered me. I also want to say Eddie Griffin was styling in this flick. Like Ooh. he had some fits that he I also I picked the best today. of the costumes. Yes. In the he, film, he his was, character he was, was great. fly. Like I would, I would rock everything he wore. So, um, but yeah, there was like a moment where it's like seventy six or seventy six or seventy six. It's like, what is that all about? But I mean, it's nine, it's ninety minutes down the road. Um, the true, true, were, true. 
were probably better than the bullets at that time. I know there were like Kansas City shout out. There were like everyone was wearing a hat, not from there. Yeah, so St. Louis, a few other ones. But in the 90s, man, the starter hats were just it. Like it didn't matter what team usually. Um, you know, I didn't see a bunch of Raiders. Were the bullets whatever. good then? The bullets sucked. They weren't the wizards yet. No, right? they were not. By 94. Uh, gosh, who was there? 94. Jeez. Yeah, it was not memorable at all. I don't uh, think they were very good. Maybe it was that when they drafted um Chris Weber? I don't know. But no, they weren't that good. It was happening in a couple of years. But um, they've never really been good, to be honest. So yeah. <laughs> Sixers had bar. Certainly not were, now. Were no. Oh gosh, not so now. yeah, maybe this was just like we're we're not cheering for these bums. <laughs> so it was but actually like, shot. Was it shot? There was is real? Philly like, like 94 Philly was pretty good, huh? They were good, uh making the playoffs every year. But it Charles was pre Ive. Yeah, you had Barkley. Yeah, yeah. Then Barkley went to Phoenix in 93. So hmm. you wouldn't have even had him. Nope. So, yeah, Oof. that's weird. Yeah, that's I think a rough, teams were rough time to be a Sixers fan. That was a hard, hard few years, man. Yeah. I yeah. thought maybe like I was like, well, like, where did like Robert Towns grew up in Chicago? So I was like, that's, there's no connection. Like, there's nothing. I was like trying to grasp at straws to find out why that was. I was but kind I just of trying to, get... to figure out. Yeah. I was trying to figure out why was this in DC? And they mentioned it a lot. I guess DC's kind of famous. Black. I mean, it's rate and it was a black city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I think, they did I think shoot the, it. They did shoot yeah. it in Baltimore, though. Just so that you know, this was actually uh, okay. shot in Baltimore. They shot in Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, mm. but it's I think they wanted to make, stand in for DC. I think they wanted to make you know the black on black crime statement kind of thing. Um, yeah, right. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. That's got to yeah, be the reason. Yeah, he was definitely trying to. Obviously, there's 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 at least a couple scenes where he makes sort of a monologue. And I think that that, you know, speaks to it. He wanted to put the right setting for it. I think there's a lot of good choices in this film. Did They're that... not always executed all that well, but like they make a lot of good choices for it. The there's last... a few confusing things, but. The last thing mm. is really, it sticks in my craw. The last yeah. thing that happens is like, you know, the thing that has happened is that the gangs have united in violence against another gang. And everyone's like, yay! <laughs> yay, we did it with more violence. Unity. <laughs> it was the threat of violence. If yes, we could was, just unify, we could be an army. It was the threat of violence. <laughs> they didn't have to be violent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was they just, to, at the very end, they didn't have to be violent. After the, the long fight yeah. <laughs> in front of everyone, <laughs> that like everyone decided after like 20 minutes of our hero getting the absolute crap kicked out of him, they were like, I can't anymore. I'm going to hit him with a record for my window. Billy Holiday. Record. Hundreds of feet away. <laughs> that was that's what really, I'm going to, that's how I, I'm contributing. I love the, uh, yeah, like I, I feel like it was leading right to it when um, Jefferson... even the dog who gets crushed rolls up and he's like, hey, get up. Yo, get get up. up. If he could get up, he would have been up already. What are you adding to what are you, you doing there, this. dog? Get out of there. Get out of there. It's your fault you got hurt. I love that, you know, he makes the statement. <laughs> You guys aren't doing anything. Er. Yes. And then at the end, they decide to do something. So I thought yeah. I thought that was. But like also perfect. his whole character the whole time was not doing things. No. You don't want to get back out there and date anymore, which. Who was who he to who is he to judge these people? He'd been like a superhero for that a week. That speech was terrible to me. <laughs> they bad. were like, yo, man, we're out of options. Maybe if he just leaves town, they'll stop killing us. And he was like, fine, I'll just leave town. And I'm like, why are you mad? Get out of there. Get out you of know there. that your powers are failing, just like bail for a little while. Yeah. You can't also, you obviously can't beat these dudes. You had superpowers, you couldn't beat them. You couldn't beat them. Like, what do you why didn't he just toss them to another city? I don't know. He's strong enough to do that. <laughs> just pick up all the golden. He could stop just... a speeding car without Rolling damage places. to himself. He can only fly three feet off the ground anyway, comfortably. So, you know, <laughs> that's you a drop, good joke. You can't that drop him very much. Good joke. It's a that's good side gag. That's good. That's good. good I gag. loved it. Uh, okay. So last thing, I think yes. um, when I mentioned that I was watching this, a lot of people were like, yo, the Marvel universe needs to do the right thing and, and recognize that Jefferson Reed is a part of the Marvel universe Agreed. because there was a comic that was released. I'm sure you guys know this mm -hmm. right after. And yeah, Marvel went all in on this and they really like he's he's as far as the comic universe, maybe not cinematic, but he is a part of the universe. He's from Earth 616, like everything is lining up. So maybe there's a maybe there's a chance. I don't know. Would you like to see this this kind of enter the MCU? If they could bring Howard the Duck back for the Avengers movies, 
and Guardians mm-hmm. of the Galaxy. Surely they could bring back Meteor Man. And it's outrageous that they didn't. He got six sequel comic books after this mm-hmm. movie in Marvel. I think he met Spider-Man in one of them. Like there mm-hmm. is precedent for this. So it feels like a real like odd thing that they did it. But again, we had to get deep, we had to get Blu-rays in order to watch this movie in the first place. So there may be some challenges that go uh, beyond uh, reason in this. That keep Can they get Blank Man? The... Can we have a, a Blank Man? It's Blank Man in the MCU? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I hope not. We, I really uh, hope not. They would oh, man. Blank, man. Oh, what and my, a next, film. my next favorite cameo out mm. of nowhere was Beverly Johnson as this yes. like, ridiculously yes. hot woman doctor that they yes. just cut to. And you're like, wow, she's like really gorgeous. Who's this? You know, and you're like, okay. So I thought that was a really great cameo to just be like, oh, just bring her in because, you know, they, we like her. They put everybody in there they wanted to i don't think he'll say true. No. michael jackson didn't say no michael jackson, michael did jackson not say no. has the opening song in the movie it's true is michael it's jackson true. robert townsend says he called in every favor and then one day he got a phone call from michael jackson who said i'm a big fan of the five heartbeats i will give you whatever you want that, oh how did this movie fail they right. had everything how did it fail the sound i mean by didn't by slap. By not totally, dude. Too legit to quits on there. Let's it's not. not. The, it's not on the CD. Same that it's not on the CD. But they're there. The they're soundtrack. in the movie though, and that's yeah. what counts. Yeah, it wasn't on the soundtrack though. Ah, yeah, that is so sad. Meg. Okay, so first and foremost, we got Mega Ran. That was awesome. We, that was great. So great. And I think I'm swayed on what I believe about this film. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, there's some some things we didn't discuss that were bads about this movie. I know what you're talking about. Well, first and that. foremost, we brought up Beverly Johnson. Sure. Who, years before, in a claim she made in, I believe it was 2014, she was one of the OG Cosby accusers. Yeah. And Cosby is in this film. We didn't talk about Cosby and how bizarre, first of all, how bizarre his character is. It is far out, this character. The, I don't know the, where, the homeless where he dog lives. Man. Yeah. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, he's in a room with people sometimes, and all of a sudden he's all alone, and he's got a lot of dogs. They give him a character. He has a name. Like, they give him yeah. a name in this, but he never speaks to anybody or no one refers to him in any real way. And then he just has a box with the media in it at some point somehow. That he touches and he touches it and he just immediately is good at like all kinds of things it's it's very strange he's one of these people that while our hero is getting the the utter stuffing knocked out of him <laughs> it's just over and over again this dude finally is like well, i do have superpowers i guess i could put it into this anytime i wanted and then mm-hmm. what he does isn't really all that helpful no not particularly per se i mean it the guns part, he does get all the guns out of there, but he does it really slowly. And in real life, I feel like that guy just gets shot. Our hero gets shot and the movie's over. <laughs> yeah. the, Which would have been problem, kind of merciful because there were like four endings to this film. Yeah. The problem is that once Cosby shows up and each time he appears on screen, it is impossible not to think about what yeah, we Yeah, and point now. being, uh, and I don't mean to belabor it, but she... This happened before they were in this film by five, six years, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was drugged but got away because she just started screaming. She knew what was happening and started screaming, and so he got her cab. The one saving grace is that they are not in the same scene. Not in the same scene, but on the same set. That's just wild. It's wild that she's sitting there and the, the aggressor is like given a hero status in this film. Yeah, she has kind of a smaller bit part in that. It's hard to see him on screen knowing it. Understanding that obviously in 1993, he is known nationwide. He's obviously oh. not a movie star. He's not a Amen. movie star. That's a, His movie at is that a, point, a, that oh, is it. But, but at that point, that's a fucking Michael Jackson level get. Yes, exactly. That is a huge get to have him, even though he doesn't have lines per se, mm, Yeah, to have him appear in your film is a mark of approval for like a gigantic crowd. And you have to assume that Robert Townsend looks up to Bill Cosby. 
certainly at this time in, in his career, looks up to Bill Cosby as yeah. a pioneer for the type of stuff that he absolutely enjoys doing and made the kind of movie that Cosby, you know, maybe would have wanted to make. Oh, the at least of, approved of, of. This was approval. Exactly. This yeah. was for approval. Like this is a big deal. This was America's like, dad being like, He's doing good work, folks. And it's super interesting because like among Robert Townsend's credits is he directed Eddie Murphy's Raw, which we know Bill Cosby had issue with Eddie Murphy's comedy, which Eddie Murphy made fun of Fair. directly in Eddie Murphy's no, Raw. No, 100%. It's, it's, so it's it's, and it's the weird, best bit like, in the whole thing. <laughs> it's a small it's a small world in the sense of that. And it's kind of the reality of it. It's like there are very few superstars at that time, black superstars in film and comedy. And like Eddie Murphy was that guy. And he was able to make the transition from TV to big screen in a tremendous way. That mm -hmm. Cosby, despite the fact Cosby was in many movies in the 70s and whatnot, when he tried to do Ghost Dad and Leonard Part Six, they were massive failures. Not even worth mentioning. Totally. But I mean, it, it can't like, be understated how popular that human was at that time. Oh, yeah. Like so commercials, that's the kids' thing. shows, uh, TV, like the one of the highest it rated was, TV shows. It was not public knowledge. You know, yeah, I mean, it had been discussed in certain circles, but it wasn't public knowledge the way it became. And no, no, not before the internet, no. So, like, you asked this question in the episode, we were in the conversation we were having it, and it goes back to how did this movie fail? How did this movie basically have a $20 I'm million dollar budget? It really is shocking. I imagine Crosby probably took no money for this. He probably did it just out of, like, friendship and willing to support i don't think he took any maybe he took mm. whatever the minimum rate you would have to get as, so i think that's know, why he doesn't say. have lines yeah i think that's why because yeah. if you get lines that's you yeah know, yeah everyone knows that's where the money is it's like yeah on camera and talking mm -hmm. if he doesn't talk then he can just be far back in the credits and take yeah. like a small check and roll you know who does it's talk a in much this movie? smaller check luther you know van also got a much smaller check yeah yeah but you know who talks in this movie the a dog. dog. A dog, a dog talks, talks in this movie, which I think we've mentioned it before on air, but there's a long running joke between the two of us that we're going to do a talking dog season. We're going to do a talking dog season. We're going to do a weirdly dog close to it. Oh and we God. accidentally we stumbled headlong into a perfect segue to a talking animals. <laughs> there are two things that happen in this episode. Oh, man. This two is things the happen in this episode. Of all time. We talked about a talking dog just now, but also we still found a way to make this movie a conversation about basketball. And I'm getting a little annoyed at the amount of basketball conversation we're having on this spot. I think we need to scale back a bit on the basketball talk, please. No. I can I listen, I can I can't promise you I'll try, but I'll try to try. It's the Cabbages Podcast Network.